Let me have you to open your Bibles, please, to the Old Testament, to a little prophet named Haggai. Haggai, near the end of the Old Testament, Zephani, right between Zephaniah and Zechariah. Haggai chapter 2. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. That's the end of the Old Testament. Haggai chapter 2. And let's read two verses there. Verses 6 and 7. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Today I want to consider earthquakes. We had a good one about a week ago. How many felt it? Okay, a lot of hands went up. And uh, the experts tell us it was centered about 10 miles, maybe 12 miles northwest of here, and uh, about three miles down into the below the surface of the earth. They have pretty accurate ways of detecting those things. My wife was uh, out of the house that night, so I went somewhere to get a hamburger for dinner. And I was sitting in a restaurant eating, by the way, those Western bacon cheeseburgers with extra barbecue sauce, they're pretty good. <laughs> anyway, I was sitting there eating, and, and suddenly the whole place began to rumble and to, to vibrate. And naturally, everyone braced themselves to see if any ceiling tiles were starting to fall or anything like that, but it didn't happen. And after a few seconds, when it was over, everybody went back to their meals. As I was leaving the restaurant, I yelled across the dining room, nice sharing an earthquake with everybody. <laughs> it's the way life is here in Southern California. But uh, here in California, this, this part of the country is prone to earthquakes. Other parts of the country have to contend with tornadoes uh, or hurricanes on the eastern coast, especially down near Florida and South Carolina in that area. But unlike tornadoes, unlike hurricanes, an earthquake gives you no advance warning to prepare. You're doing, going about your business and suddenly everything starts to tremble and shake and you're, you're beside yourself wondering, what do I do? What do I do? And there have been some very deadly ones over uh, the course of history. The most powerful earthquake ever recorded was in Chile back in 1960, registered 9.5 on the Richter scale killed 4,485 people and left uh, 2 million people homeless because it knocked down all the poorly made homes that they were living in. In 1964, the Gulf of Alaska was hit by a 9.2 magnitude quake. It caused a tsunami that reached heights of 67 meters. That's 219 feet high. If you can imagine a tidal wave coming in that high. Killed 128 people in that one. And uh, some of you may be old enough to recall the tsunami or the tidal wave that hit Indonesia back in 2004. It was felt in 14 different countries and caused the death of 230,000 people. It took them weeks and weeks to keep adding up the death toll as they were finding and discovering more dead bodies. And undoubtedly, some people were swept out to sea whose bodies were never recovered. They counted them among the dead. And throughout history, even before the, the uh, advent of the high-tech measuring equipment, men have been recording earthquakes around the world. Christ said there would be earthquakes in diverse places, Matthew 24, verse 7, before he returns. And um, in 1952, a quake was centered in the waters near Russia, but Hawaii got the brunt of the tsunami which was created and headed that direction. In August 1868, an earthquake in Peru killed 25,000 people. On January 26, 1700, the American Indians, they call them Native Americans, but I, call, I use the, the pilgrim's term, American Indians, 
uh, recorded an earthquake in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the tsunami, which was created out in the ocean, uh, hit Japan the next day on January 27th, 1700. And Japan has suffered some devastating earthquakes and tsunamis uh, that hit their coastline. So let's consider earthquakes for a little while today. And I call this sermon today, Shake, Rattle, and Roll. Earthquakes are featured prominently in the scriptures, a number of places. And so there must be something God wants us to learn from them. I want you to, first of all, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 19. I'll have you turn to a few places, some I won't need you to turn to, but turn to Exodus 19, and let's look at two verses there. Exodus 19, verses 17 and 18. That's right in your Old Testament, right after Exodus chapter 18. It says, And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount, that's the base of the mountain, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Lesson number one, earthquakes um, serve to get man's attention. They get man's attention. Here, God called Moses up to Mount Sinai to tell him to go back down and remind the people not to come up to the mountain. Verse 19. Or verse 21, rather. And the sound of a trumpet mentioned there, verse 19, gives, also gives us a, a picture, a glimpse of the rapture one day. God tells Moses to come up to the mount and he's gonna tell the saints, come up hither, according to Revelation 4 verse one. A sometimes a dramatic event is necessary in order to reinforce the serious nature of God's law. In this case, fire and smoke and an earthquake. God could have told Moses the things he wanted to tell him in his tent but they wouldn't have had the force and the weight of the word of God behind them. The people needed to see that. God told them that not even the priests were allowed to come up to the mountain unless God uh, permitted it. Verses down there in verses 22, 23, and 24. You know, in the world today, there are many so-called priests, and I might add to that ministers and rabbis of various kinds, who will not go up in the rapture because they do not truly know Jesus Christ. They think they do, and they get a, a paycheck to do a religious thing uh, each week, but they don't know where they're going. They don't know Jesus Christ. They've never been introduced to Jesus Christ. Man has been able to shake the earth in, in a limited capacity by testing atomic weapons and detonating nuclear weapons, um, in his various experiments, but only God can shake the earth like he does, having it originate three to four miles below the earth's surface and then watching the ripple effect spread out for 40, 50, 60 miles in all directions, sometimes thousands of miles if we're talking about a tsunami. I mean, only God can do those things. And if that doesn't get your attention, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Next, Go, if you will, to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. Here, the prophet Elijah has slain 400 false prophets of Baal in the previous chapter, chapter 18, in a great contest. And God was vindicated before the heathen that day. That every victory... Every mountaintop experience must be followed by some challenge, by some low point in the valley. You can't stay on the mountaintop all the time. I wish that I could. You wish that you could. You know, people buy homes uh, up in the hills eh, because the scenery is nice and the, there's less stress. They, the, they're above the city lights. They can see the stars at night sometimes and a number of other benefits, but uh, 
a good fire takes place and mudslides can wash away your home right up in the mountains, just like any other part of the country can be devastated. And uh, even living on the mountaintop all the time uh, has its drawbacks. But now Elijah is in that low point. Queen Jezebel has sworn to kill him for having slain her prophets, and she's sent out men to hunt down Elijah. He's hiding in a cave, uh, thinking that he's all alone. He's the only one standing for the Lord God of Israel. God speaks to him, notice verse 11, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7 tells us, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Too often, we want God to manifest himself in some spectacular, magnificent way so that nobody can badmouth God or talk bad about the Lord Jesus Christ or mock the Word of God or mock Christians who believe in the Word of God. We wish God would just step in and wipe somebody out. But the Lord chooses not to operate that way. He doesn't do those things like we would want him to. Notice verses 12 and 13. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him, and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? The Lord God is not interested in men following after extraordinary events or some spectacular thrill and then telling themselves that this is the spiritual life. How, how much does that happen, do you think, in contemporary churches where the praise band does their number, they do their gig, they, they do their set of songs, and everybody else is out there just passively watching and being entertained? You know, the words are, are thrown up on the big screen inside their church building, 7-Eleven songs, right? Seven words, and you repeat it 11 times. And uh, they, they, they treat uh, the, the assembly of the saints, they treat the local work of the local church like uh, some sort of theatrical play, some sort of sensational entertainment venue. There was one preacher who built a big mega church, and his sermons were simply like a, a stand-up comic. He would sort of do sort of a monologue like, Jay Leno used to do on the Tonight Show or these other comics do on the late night shows. And that was just how he preached his sermons. And thousands of people would come and listen to him. And then eventually that thing fell flat because there was no depth to it, no spiritual life to it. And he had to repent of what he had done. But um, the Lord is not interested in men following after sensationalistic uh, things of that nature. God wants men to hear his words. This is what's important to God, that you hear his words. You understand and know what God has said. Reading and studying and believing your Bible, I promise you, will reveal more to you than following after some faith healer on television or Learning to speak or learning to speak with other tongues or getting slain in the spirit. Uh, learning your Bible, reading your Bible, and believing what you're reading in the Bible will yield more fruit and benefit you more spiritually than all the other sensationalistic garbage. The Lord says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it, my word, shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So lesson number two is this. Uh, earthquakes comfort the saints in a strange way. They comfort the saints because they remind you that the thing that's really important to God is not all the sensationalistic stuff, but it's his word. That's what's important to, to God, that men know his words, hear his words, 
read his words, believe his words. That is going to be the test. Did you believe what God said to you in his word? Not how much sensationalist, sensationalism you followed after, not how many great spectacular events you attended, not how many Christian rock concerts you went to, not any number of things, but it's going to be, did you believe his word? So earthquakes, in a strange way, actually comfort the saints. At least they should. Now let me read two texts that go together. You don't need to turn, but you can write these references down. And they are, first of all, Amos 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. That's all it says. And along with that is Zechariah 14, verse 5. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. This passage is foreseeing and predicting the return of the Messiah one day, what we call the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's preceded by the battle of Armageddon. In Zechariah 14, 2, it says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth to fight against those nations. Verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And then the Bible says the Mount of Olives is going to split into two mountains, one to the north and one to the south. And there will be a valley running east and west in between those two. And God mentions this uh, earthquake, uh, that, which was part of their historic record, evidently. It was significant enough that they recorded it uh, and connected it to the time certain kings reigned in Judah and in Israel. Uh, and he refers to this as a picture of a future quake that's going to divide the landscape. It's going to, and people will be in terror, fleeing for their lives, wondering what to do when that earthquake comes. So lesson three today, let me say this, uh, the lesson of earthquakes is they testify to God's promise, God's promises uh, in the future. They testify to God's future promise, let me put it that way. Uh, that takes us back to our opening text in Haggai chapter two. And I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. You know, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, uh, who will rule uh, with global peace and global righteousness under his uh, domain, he is the desire of all nations. He's the one that everyone in the world wants, even if they don't want to admit it. The world wants peace. It won't come without the Prince of Peace. The world wants absolute righteousness and, and people to obey the law. It won't come until the righteous one comes to enforce it. Genesis 9, verses 13 through 17, tell us that God put the rainbow in the clouds as a reminder to men that he will no more drown the world out with a flood. Every time you see that rainbow when the, the uh, prism effect is just so with the clouds after rain, that's a reminder that God has promised he will not destroy the world with a flood. But conversely, every earthquake should be a reminder, another warning, that he is going to destroy this world with an earthquake. He'll shake the entire world and just change the entire topography and the geography and the landscape like nothing else could ever do. You can get on the internet right now and you can watch some dumb videos about people saying, you know, the, the poles are going to switch. And I don't know if they mean the earth is going to turn upside down, uh, but they keep talking about these great changes in the landscape and tectonic plates and the weather patterns changing and so forth. I don't know how much truth there is in any of that. All I do trust in is what we read in God's book. Amen. That's where your trust has to be. Now, before we get to that final earthquake, uh, let me tell you about three other texts, and I'll run through them quickly for time's sake. You can write them down. 
um, at the crucifixion, Matthew 27, verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Matthew 28, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. This would be at his resurrection, or just before his resurrection. And then Acts 16, verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. This is Paul and Silas, right, in the Philippian jail. Verse 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. So lesson four from earthquakes is earthquakes testify of Jesus Christ. They testify of Jesus, they testify of his death, they testify of his burial, they testify of his resurrection, and they testify of his power to save a soul for all of eternity. And we might add they testify to his divine power. His divine power. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, day unto day utter the speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And um, the entire creation around you, what they call the natural world, and um, all the visible elements comprising it, uh, all testify to the splendor, to the magnificence, and to the power of Jesus Christ. You know what? The Lord Jesus has no rivals. He has no competitors. He has no equals. There's nobody that can challenge the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the first to rise from the dead by his own power. And he's the only one that can save a soul from its sin. Amen. Now lastly, turn to the book of Revelation. There are a series of earthquakes mentioned during the tribulation, marking some significant uh, elements during that time. Revelation chapter 8 First of all, Revelation 8, verse 5 <clears throat> says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Verse 4 says, The smoke of the incense cup says, came up with the prayers of the saints. Now, your prayers and mine are likened to sweet-smelling incense in the smelling or the nostrils of God, according to Psalm 141, verse 2, and Revelation 8, 5. It's not hard to guess who the saints are in this context. They would be those who were crying and asking God, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon them which dwell on the earth? Back in chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Uh, wondering how long until God dispenses his judgment and wrath upon their enemies. And their prayers are uh, seem to come back and cast back down to the earth, verse 5, but this time with a vengeance. And then we read the two witnesses are, that are slain by the Antichrist, Revelation 11. And their dead bodies lie in the streets for three and a half days, out in the open, while the world celebrates their death. Then, after three and a half days, everyone's seen them lying there, and they're whooping and hollering, and the Bible says giving gifts back forth to one another in celebration of these two uh, people preaching, uh, preaching righteousness and warning the world against uh, the, the man of sin and the coming again of Christ, undoubtedly. And when the world is tired of hearing them, they don't want to hear them any longer, the Antichrist uh, uh, is able to kill them, and leave their dead bodies in the streets, and undoubtedly the cameras are rolling, and either by satellite and internet, uh, everybody will be able to watching it, you know, around the world at simultaneously. And after three and a half days, let me tell you something, after three and a half days, a body is not very fresh if left outside, left outdoors. But after three and a half days, they come back to life again, stand up. And the whole world is watching that. 
and then they ascend into heaven while the entire world beholds it. And uh, God marks that event, he marks their ascent with an earthquake, according to Revelation 11, verses 11 through 13. Now this is the last earthquake just near the end of the tribulation, sent to warn the world one more time of what's just about to take place, what's just about to happen. Now I'll go, if you will, back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6 and uh, verses 12 and 13. Revelation 6 verses 12 and 13. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This is going to be the great earthquake that shakes the whole world. This will be the earthquake that Haggai prophesied in our, in our opening text today. This will be the earthquake that uh, described by the prophet Zechariah in his day, which separates Mount uh, the Mount of Olives into two mountains, changing, like I said, the entire landscape and the topography, that part of the world. There will be the earthquake, this will be the earthquake, rather, that all other earthquakes have foreshadowed in human history throughout the world. Every one was a warning, an advanced warning, of this one that's going to shake the entire world. And the narrative here, verses 12 and 13, wonderfully matches that of Joel chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. And for time's sake, we won't turn there. But uh, go to the book of Joel someday and read verses uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And he describes a mighty army, an invading army, coming from space. That's what the world's waiting for. They're waiting for an invasion from outer space. Oh, they want a candy coat and sugar coat to make it entertaining in sci-fi movies and so forth. But they're going to have one, and it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ as captain of his host. And you and I will be in glorified, resurrected form, made just like his invincible, indestructible body. And we will come back with him as an army to lay waste the armies of the Antichrist and uh, dominate the world from that time forward. And the entire world will be shaken with that event. So lesson number five, earthquakes show and they testify that God means what he says. He's been warning him for thousands of years. And Christ said the earthquakes would increase as, as we approach closer to his return. Earthquakes in diverse places, Matthew 24, verse 7. And by golly, there are, there are earthquakes taking place in places that, uh, where they never had earthquake activity. Earthquakes in the Midwest, earthquakes in the southern states, earthquakes back east. That's not something just limited here to California on the, right, the San Andreas Fault. It's not something just limited to San Francisco, you know, and all the queers up there that need to be wiped out. Uh, but uh, God sends earthquakes all around the world to convince men, to remind men of what his book says. When Japan gets an earthquake, that's a warning from God. When Russia gets an earthquake, that's a warning from God. When Hawaii gets hit with another earthquake or a tsunami, that's another warning from God. There's going to come one big... Now, the, I'll close right here. Um, Caltech and the, the, the U.S. Geological Service, they keep warning us of a big one that's going to hit California, that we need to prepare. It might be 9.5 or 10 on the Richter scale. And we're overdue, they say, and it could happen any time. So you should stock up on extra, you know, drinking water and extra food and make sure you have good batteries in your flashlight. And um, a couple of firearms wouldn't hurt either, by the way. <laughs> and, um, and, and be ready because it might happen. And that's probably sound advice. It might happen. There may be another one that uh, wipes out big parts of Southern California. And uh, you want to be prepared and look out. Be, but if, if, they can give warnings against that earthquake, and it's wise to heed their advice. How much more should men heed the advice of God and get saved? Amen. Why some unsaved guy goes through life and says, well, 
uh, I can put it off. I can wait till later. It doesn't really, it's not an emergency. It's not a pressing issue with me right now. Yeah, you'll think that uh, when uh, the earthquake comes and you're left behind after the rapture and you face seven years of, of the man of sin living on the Antichrist, still rebelling against God and are caught off guard when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Don't let that happen to you.